FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. And welcome. You are listening to and perhaps even watching the Financial Survival Network. And I'm Carrie Lutz. Today is September 30th, 2020. Well, we're very blessed to have with us the good doctor, Dr. Ted Noel. And we're going to be talking about COVID, the real story, what's really happening, especially in Florida, now that our governor has decided to reopen the state and reopen all businesses, which has many of uh, the naysayers' uh, panties in a bunch, to say the least. I'd like to get your opinion about it. And you can email us at kl at harrylutz.com. Well, Dr. Ted, it's great to have you back on, as always. And so, thank you for having me. Okay. So we have a, a conundrum here. Florida has reopened. In my county, they're allowed to reduce certain numbers of attendees at businesses, but they're going to be required to justify that reduction, and we'll see how that works. So they're trying this in restaurants and bars, et cetera. I don't think it's going to fly for very long because I think they're, they're going to have to show the science for reduce, reducing the uh, capacity in a uh, particular establishment. Uh, what's your take on what uh, the good governor has done? The governor's finally done what he should have done at the very beginning. He opened up Florida. Florida should never have been closed, and the data now is pretty darn clear. Lockdowns harmed us more than they helped us. And even if we look at the advertised numbers of supposed COVID deaths, they have not yet reached one month of excess deaths. And if we look at the work by John Ioannidis, Scott Atlas, and others from Stanford, Every pandemic in the world has resulted in roughly one month of excess deaths. We haven't gotten there quite. It wasn't that bad. And, you know, then the question is benefits. We did everything backwards. We should have quarantined the sick people. Instead, we're quarantining the healthy people. That's never been shown to work. What it does is it kills jobs. And the deadliest disease known to man is poverty. When you're out of work, you are automatically poor. So the problem is poverty. And by the way, if we look at the Democrat states versus Republicans, it turns out that the Democrat states lock down harder and their unemployment remains about two points higher than Republican states on average. And it doesn't matter whether you look at the legislature, it's always the governor, because the governor makes the edicts. And the governors are responsible, not just as Governor Cuomo did, Cuomo, Cuomo did by killing people in nursing homes, but rather by locking people down, he killed people through poverty. And yeah, well, it's just bad news. So the way I look at it is, uh, for many of the people that passed on, it's kind of like uh, automobile rebates and automobile incentives. When sales are flagging, the car companies will put all these incentives, 0% mm -hmm. money back, and all it does is take sales from the future and bring them to the present. Effectively, what COVID has done is something similar. Now, obviously, if you have several comorbidities, you might last for a number of years, and there's people around who aren't walking around now, who might otherwise be, but maybe it moved up for most of the deaths. Maybe it moved them up by six months, if that. Well, Italy is the prime example where I have the data. The average age of death from COVID-19 in Italy was 82. The average life expectancy in Italy is 82.7. All the epidemic did really was change the date on the death certificate. Yeah. Well, we're all going to go and we all want to stay as long as we can. But people moving into nursing homes, 50% of them are gone in six months or less. Mm -hmm. So 
Uh, in New York, uh, they have 13,000 extra empty nursing home beds. So we could pretty much extrapolate that somewhere around 13,000 people died in nursing homes as a result of uh, Governor Cuomo's edicts. Yeah, and what's going to happen almost certainly over time is that this epidemic will be absorbed in the overall death rates declining slightly, and you won't be able to tease out any notable amount, but over the next year or two years, we'll see slightly lower death rates from all other causes, and ultimately it comes out in the wash. Yeah, and probably this coming flu season, we'll see less deaths because Mm -hmm. Many of these people would have died from the flu or cold season. I mean, a cold for somebody in this state could be fatal. And well, yeah, if you get a cold and it goes to a bronchitis and you have some chronic lung disease, it can become a pneumonia and pneumonia can kill you. It's, you know, ultimately what we have done is the incredible stupidity. You had Trump was listening to a virologist. This is a lab rat. He's a bureaucrat. The only thing he knows is transmission of this disease, and he openly admitted that he wasn't concerned with any of the other damages. If yeah. at the time Trump had had uh, Scott Atlas and Carl Hennigan on his team, they would have said, whoa, wait a minute, back off. It's not going to help. Yeah, that's so true. And uh, the thing about hydroxychloroquine, okay, just right, just downright disgraceful, politicizing a drug that in the majority of studies, over 60 studies, has shown in the early stages and even in the latter stages can save people's lives along with zinc and uh, zinc impacts, right? Yeah. As we've studied more, the picture has gotten a little muddier, but here's the, here's the key. Hydroxychloroquine has almost zero downside. Even the most critical of studies say we had this percentage of people had side effects, but when you read down in the fine print, what did they have? They had a little upset stomach. That's not exactly a deal breaker. Yeah, and, and yeah, no and, part of side effects to speak of. And in many of the studies that panned it, they were giving higher almost toxic levels of the drug and that uh, that hasn't shown to be beneficial the higher the level the mm -hmm. small doses 200 milligrams per day have shown to be most effective well there are a couple of things going on here remember trump took it as a prophylactic and he probably should still be on it because if you look at the malaria belt they take it regularly and they have a very low incidence of the wuhan flu on the other side what are the side effects? I golf with an in interventional cardiologist who gives lots of his or sees lots of patients who are on hydroxychloroquine. He says, I've never seen a case of torsade de point, which is the rhythm disturbance that they're all excited about and hyped about. You know, I don't see people with problems. These people tolerate the drug beautifully. But the issue here, when you get down to it, is how do we look at science? Because remember, science is not an answer. Science is a method. And the scientific method allows you to create ways of testing ideas. And just to give you an example, we had a paper came out of UC Davis this last week that proposed to say, oh, masks are great. And so if I look at this uh, paper, here's the gadget that they used to set up the study. Now, the gadget is a laminar flow hood, and those are very common things. Basically, what happens is, as you look up there, the blue, the air flows down through that into the box and out into the room. When that happens, it keeps the inside sterile because it's highly filtered air. Then what they did was they took good old funnel, oh. put it right close like this, and hooked it up to a suction gadget and measured how, my, how many particles of various sizes were, uh, were uh, produced by breathing, talking, and coughing. Okay? They got numbers. Then what they did was they had people wear a mask. 
and put the funnel up here and do the same thing. Well, let's take a look at what actually happens, okay? My fancy vape, which I got for this purpose. <laughs> Boom. I turned it hey, off. You're not vaping there. I turned it off. I forgot. Okay. That's an aerosol. That's what they're measuring by and large. And if I take a vape here and put it into the funnel, you can see most of it goes into the funnel. But let me take my headset off here. I'm going to do this with, see if I can make it happen. These things always catch on my glasses. Okay, here we go. Uh huh. So it doesn't go through there. How much of it the even gets close to the funnel? None. <laughs> Science and is so, supposed to be a search for truth, right? Right. So what they're doing is they're measuring how much came through that specific. Hang on a second. Got to turn the picture off. What did I do? Okay, how much came through the mask? And it's no surprise, you're going to see it cut down. And the reason is the mask redirects everything both directions. And then the other part, if I look back at the experimental apparatus for a second, the air is flowing out of the box. That means all of that vape that I put on the side blows into the room and never gets near the measurement. Yet, when these people measured this, they, they got this huge statement of, we measured this 90% reduction in particles, and that means you should wear masks. Now, I know it came out of UC Davis, which is part of the People's Republic of California, and these guys get their paychecks signed by Governor Gruesome. But the <laughs> fact is... They didn't answer the right question. They deliberately set up their experiment in a way which was designed to get the answer they wanted. And if they had bothered to look at the CDC's own publication in May, they have a journal called Experimental Infectious Diseases. And EID published a paper which was what we call a meta-analysis. And that means that they lumped together a whole bunch of studies. And they do that to try to get a higher power answer, a better answer, more robust answer. After reviewing 14 peer-reviewed studies, they found no evidence that masks had any effect on transmission of H1N1 flu. Well, H1N1 is transmitted the same way as COVID-19, as President Trump said on February 7 to Bob Woodward. February 7. And when the Surgeon General and Anthony Fauci both said there was no point in the public wearing masks, they were right. Because the issue has absolutely nothing to do with the mask. Your aerosol just changes direction with the mask. That's it. And so what happens now, and we'll get to the half full restaurant in a second is if you're in a restaurant, the air conditioning is going to pick up what you breathe out, run it through the air handler, and bring it back in. In the meantime, you're breathing more. And what happens then is that you get more and more and more aerosol built up because those aerosols can live in the air for up to three hours. Well, if your average meal is an hour, hour and a half, guess what? You're loading up the air. And that's exactly what they showed in Guangzhou, China. There was a restaurant. You had three tables. A guy in the middle table was sick. His aerosols were pulled across the next table down to the air return, up through the air handler, back down across the table, upstream from him, across him. And that was the cycle. And people on the, all of those three tables got sick. Why? because he was already sick. Now, interestingly, there were tables to the side, and because of the airflow pattern, the tables to the side didn't get any. 
But we know that if you were to put high intensity ultraviolet lights inside the air handler, which we have done at my church, it kills viruses, molds, fungi, and all the rest of those almost instantly. Kind of like being outside, right? Like living outside. You see, the fix for COVID-19 super spreading is really simple. Go outside. And there are two ways to go outside. One is to go outside where Trump's rallies are. Yeah. The other one it is, is to bring the outside in either by opening windows or adding UV. Yeah, those are political protests. They aren't rallies. They're political peaceful protests. protests. Peaceful protests are okay, but you know, going to church or whatever, none of that. Yeah, the virus is smart. It's only going to affect people in church, not in a in a riot. I mean, the whole thing is so moronic. Plus, we now know that a large portion of the population has to have immunity because mm-hmm. everyone would have gotten this thing by now. And that number is probably 80 plus percent. Go okay. back to the Diamond Princess, right? Mm-hmm. All those people living literally in a Petri dish and only, I think, 13% or 17%, I never remember which, got infected. It's it's uh, somewhere short of 20%. But here's the other key on Diamond Princess. If 20% got sick, what happened to the other 80%? It turns out that between 50 and 60% of us have what's called T-cell immunity. And think about this. With T-cells, what you have is the cell that actually remembers the fact that you got infected. And it can stir up the production of antibodies. And if you were infected with a common cold virus, a particular coronavirus, not a rhinovirus, but a coronavirus that's similar to COVID-19, then you've probably got T-cell immunity. And you are good to go. There's no big deal here. Uh, But let's talk about some of the so-called... vaccines that are coming down the pike i have some very real questions about them and i remain skeptical until i hear more because what we have uh the moderna vaccine i've taken some look at it is actually messenger rna now messenger rna goes into cells and codes for production of uh proteins antibodies are fancy proteins So if you actually code for the uh, protein that's called an antibody, you're going to make a bunch of antibodies. But what happens over time? That RNA fades away and you quit making antibodies. Did the T cells get turned on to say, hey, I got an invader? I don't know. My guess is all of these mRNA so-called vaccines are going to be shown to be really good during a pandemic for a couple of months. But then they're worthless because you're not actually creating memory inside the immune system. We'll have to see. But that's what I'm thinking right now. It's a really interesting point. I know for myself, uh, when I was 19, that's a long time ago, I got the flu, turned into pneumonia. It was hospitalized. Mm -hmm. Knock on wood, in 40 some odd years since then, I've never gotten the flu again. And Mm -hmm. Obviously, there's some kind of immunity that I got to it. I know I was exposed multiple times from different people to whatever the flu du jour was, and yet mm-hmm. I never got it. Now, it doesn't mean I won't get it tomorrow or the next season or the next, but it's interesting that I managed to go 40 some odd years without it. it. Tells you something about immunity, doesn't it? It does. And you probably have T cell immunity. And that's variable between individuals. We know that as people get older, some of them will develop what's called anergy, A-N-E-R-G-Y, which is they quit responding to immune stimuli or to antigenic stimuli, I should say. And those people have some difficulties in handling infections. Right. Right. So look at all the damage that has been wrought by these lockdowns and continues to be wrought in blue states in particular, I mean, it's, you know, New York, uh, New Jersey, Connecticut, Michigan, California, Illinois, and, uh, and a host of other states. Mm-hmm. And really, the guy who was furthest out ahead of the whole thing was Governor Kemp of uh, Georgia. He opened it up right away, and Christy Nome, 
and a couple of others who didn't uh, go for the lockdowns. But how did we wind up with these lockdowns when there were so many knowledgeable scientists and doctors who were completely opposed to them from the get-go? That just because we relied on Dr. Dr. Fauci? Yeah, well, remember, I'm a doctor. He only plays one on TV. He gave up taking care of patients right after his residency and became a lab rat. And he is a bureaucrat. And the law of the bureaucrat says you have to be in place because you are the only one who has the answer to the problem. And now we have subsidized his pride by putting him out in front of the cameras. And the law of subsidy says you subsidize something, you're going to get more of it. It's going to get more expensive. So what happens is Fauci now, he says, I have my 15 minutes of fame. I like this. I want more of it. So he finds ways to be the answer all the way along. And it ends up costing us many, many lives. I mean, and you talk about lockdown. Um, I did a spreadsheet looking at data. I forgot to put this one up on screen, but Basically, if you look at the states who locked down or remain locked down late, which are uh, California, Illinois, New Jersey, New York, Oregon, Virginia, and Washington, and Wyoming, Wyoming is the only one of the Republican governor. The lockdown average unemployment is two points higher than all of the other states. Remember, poverty is the deadliest disease known to man. But let's look at something else. If we were to compare places that locked down versus those that did not, and you look at Brazil and Peru, they are next door neighbors. How much did the lockdown help Brazil, uh, Peru? By this, absolutely none. Right. And as a matter of fact, this is typical of places where there have been lockdowns. If we look at masks, notice in Austria, they mandated masks at the arrow up here. And you can see how much it helped. If you look at Poland, same kind of story. You can see how much it helped. But here's the fun part. If we look at our daily confirmed COVID deaths, now this is a month or so old, but the historic data is about the same. Where did the big mask mandates come in? You want to guess? After the uh, majority of deaths occurred, right? Right in this middle spot. We were already on the way down. So did the mask mandates do anything? The answer is no. Carl Hennigan, who is chair of or director of the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine at Oxford University, flat out said in an interview on Unheard TV, there is no evidence that masks reduce infection. And that is perfectly in line with the CDC's own data. Yep. And we, uh, we did a show called The Great American Mask Hoax and mm -hmm. talked about that. And now we're past it, but eventually the country's got to open up. I guess it's just going to open up on November 4th, all the states. Uh, most likely, right? most likely. Right? I mean, mm -hmm. that's what we're talking about, right? Unless Biden's elected, in which case he's going to impose a lockdown. Yeah, in perpetuity. Yes. In perpetuity. So, so we've gone through all this. I hope we've learned something from it. So a guy like Scott Atlas, he's on the president's advisory panel now and they dr redfield and dr fauci are publicly besmirching him saying he doesn't know what he's talking about and guys like dr reish over in yale they're all getting slammed not to mention the frontline doctors they were excised censored from youtube and from twitter and everywhere else facebook i mean how is the truth supposed to get out here Trump needs to quit yelling in the debate, wait for Biden to dig himself a hole and then come out forward, just lay it on the line. And when the mask question got asked, he needed to stand up and say, look, there is no data that these have any benefit for anybody. And I challenge Redfield and Fauci to show me the data that they help. 
The fact is, as I've shown, they can't. Yep. Yep. But there are a bunch of bogus studies out there, but the studies that happened before before COVID are much more instructive than the ones that have happened after. Now, what's interesting, though, if we look at it, the actual policy that went in under Obama and Biden for H1N1 made a whole lot more sense than what we did here. And they did it because they had no idea what to do. And so they said, okay, we're done testing. That's it. You guys go on about your business. And and the disease burned itself out. And that raises the question, what is the value of a COVID test? My grandson and his wife are all panic stricken that I might cause our great granddaughter to die. So Nancy and I went out and got COVID tests. Okay. Of course, mine was done a week ago and who knows if I've been exposed since then, I'm going to make things work. You know, maybe I was exposed driving away from the uh, center where I got the test. Or maybe you know, there's some left on your microphone from whenever. Yeah, it's yeah. Dirt. But the point is, there's fundamental premise in testing. If I am a clinical physician, I do a test because the answer to that test may change what I do. That means the test has to be reliable and it has to be timely. Okay. That's why we've developed a huge number of what are called point of care tests. And basically you put a couple of drops of blood on a fancy chip. It goes into a little thing the size of your cell phone. And in two minutes, you have an answer for, you know, hematocrit for uh, all of your electrolytes and so on, and which is incredibly useful in the operating room and in the intensive care unit. Right. Incredibly useful. But a COVID test, what does that tell us? Nothing. It tells us something that happened two weeks ago. And by the time we get the answer back, it's horrid. But let's go further into the reliability question. And here's where things get really interesting with the law of subsidy. Remember, you subsidize something, you get more of it, it gets more expensive. The law of subsidy applied to COVID goes like this. Anybody admitted to the hospital with a COVID diagnosis, hospital gets 12 grand extra. If they were put on a ventilator they get 36 grand extra that's in the law yeah it's there so okay a real incentive financial incentive and so my cardiologist buddy who takes care of patients in the hospital finds himself being pushed by people who are employed by the hospital called coders to say this patient has covid or symptoms of covid or whatever else and the answer he he looks back at him and says ain't doing it i'm not going to lie about this but what happens is that you get more and more. And there is a certain number. If we look at the, the gold standard test, it's the polymerase chain reaction or the PCR test. Which was never designed for what it's being used. It for. was designed for lab work. And what they do is they take a swab. Some of the material from that swab is put in this gadget where you multiply it. You double it, you double it, you double it, you double it again. And as I recall, the number is 30. If it's positive by 30, there was stuff there, okay? But they're multiplying this more. They're going out to 45. Well, now, anything that I may have had from two months ago, if there's any of it hanging around, boom, I show up positive. If it, if it cross-reacts at all with the common cold, which is another coronavirus, I show up positive. So, you know, you have a test which is neither reliable nor timely. There's nothing you can do about it. Our proper answer is there is a good use for these tests, and that is for study, for investigation. It is not for management of people. It is for investigation. What portion of the population has it? Stanford did a bunch of studies using it that way. And this is the kind of thing that helps us understand the disease. It's not proper to use it for anything in terms of clinical medicine. It just doesn't work. Yeah, we know that is a fact. There's no question about it. We know this to be absolutely true. But we kind of have to wrap up here. Okay. Uh, but it's always great to have you on. So if we have to summarize it, we made a big blunder with a global shutdown that literally destroyed the global economy. Uh, whether this was created uh, deliberately re- Released by the Chinese. I'm sure it was created by them. I doubt it was deliberately released because it's only uh, inured to their great detriment. They become a pariah nation for all the 
dastardly things they did in uh, not being transparent, honoring the market on PPE, all of these things, they're really now a pariah nation in a major mm -hmm. economic fit. So I don't buy that they released it deliberately. I think that was an act of insanity if they did, but it's always possible. But now our reaction to it, really the major harm that was done by the virus, our reaction to it of the global shutdown, relying upon the World Health Organization, relying upon the CDC and the National Institute of Health has put us in the jam where we're in now so I guess at this point, the best we can hope for, doctor, is to learn from it and not allow it to happen again. Right. And all of these diseases burn themselves out. There's no way around it. It was what we call in the wild before we actually did anything. And a disease in the wild, you cannot stop. It will do what it's going to do. Your only thing you can do is to protect the most vulnerable until the disease burns itself out. That is it. Yeah, and everything else is incredibly harmful. We haven't even talked about all of the cancers that have gone undetected, all of the people who had heart attacks because they were afraid to go to the emergency room. My cardiologist buddy talks about this all the time. Yeah, it's really a crime. And so many other bad side effects. Like you said, the biggest killer in the world is poverty. Because when you're in poverty, you don't go for your regular medical health uh, reviews, checkups, and you're, you're exposed to a plethora of diseases that in the non-poverty stricken world have all but disappeared. But in the poverty stricken world, yeah, like, mm -hmm. like tuberculosis, you know, people who oh, live yeah. a decent lifestyle don't get TB, but people who are living on the streets, they're chronically infected with well, we could go on all day. We know here that the supposed cure was far worse than the disease. And I think that's the final conclusion to be drawn from this. Doctor, we want to find out more about you. We want to take a look at your analysis on the various politicians' health. Where is the best place to find you these days? I'm on Facebook, MeWe, Parlor, and Twitter. And I post as dr ted that's one word and uh if you have to look it up another way it's at vidzet v-i-d-z-e-t-t-e -T -T -E. and i'm out there pretty much every day and we really appreciate your work and one thing we didn't show is the actual number of covid deaths ones they've actually been able to pin on covid and yesterday in florida we had two that will probably go up to 10 in the coming days ahead but 10 out of 22 million inhabitants in the state isn't even a statistical uh, rounding error here. Florida loses about 800 people a day just by all causes. Yeah, and you got it, and you could just multiply that. So that means that California loses 1,600, New York loses about 700, Texas probably loses 1,200. I mean, it's just just statistics. And that's the other alarming thing, and I'll let you go, is the inability of the average people in the country to comprehend and properly analyze statistics, simple rows of numbers, and instead go into a fear-based mentality, a panic of sorts, and bring down everything around them. It's just shocking. Yeah, no context. And then there's no correct answer. Exactly. Other than to panic and be in a fear-based mind state, which means make the worst decisions when you're panicked. And, mm -hmm. You know, the reason a lot of pilot training, airline pilots that take place is subject them to every possible hypothetical disaster. So when disaster strikes, they're used to it and they don't panic. Unfortunately, we don't get anti-panic training as in the ordinary course of our lives, other than to, uh, to practice yourself. You have no defense against panic. And that is uh, kind of where we're at now. Anyway, any questions or comments, email us, kl at kerrylutz.com, Twitter feed at Kerry Lutz, Facebook page is Financial Survival Network, 
Sign up for a free newsletter, financialsurvivalnetwork.com. Doctor, always a pleasure. Can't thank you enough for coming on. Oh, and it's always a pleasure to be with you. Anytime you want me, give me a haul. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.